Good morning, my dear friends. Welcome to this Lord's Day service of worship and praise. We're so glad to be with you this morning. Here at First Church Congregational in Fairfield, we seek to extend the extravagant welcome of God to you and to all people. We are a church that is here for you and that seeks to serve the world on God's behalf, regardless of who you are or where you are in life's journey, or maybe more importantly, because of who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. Um, regardless of a race, class, gender identity, marital status, ability, age, immigration status, who you love, this is a spiritual home that is open and ready to embrace you and to share with you in the proclamation of the gospel, the good news of God's love, both in word and, and in deed. So very glad to be with you this morning. Um, I'm David Spollett, one of the pastors at uh, First Church, and I want to thank uh, deacons Rita Skog and Clara Harmon, uh, who will be leading worship with me this morning. And again, thank uh, David McInnes and uh, Andrew McInnes, who is now today our technical director. And great thanks to Sherry Evan for all the Sundays that she has given an unstinting service in making all of this work. I have several announcements that I'd like to uh, share with you. Oh, and also thanks to uh, Paul uh, Jacobson, uh, who as you now know is in Indiana, but is still with us through the miracles of recording. Um, his beautiful uh, prelude this morning, talked with Paul this week. He's very, very happy, misses us, sends his love to everybody, but he feels that he is very much uh, in the right place in Muncie, Indiana. And I agree, as much as we miss him, we celebrate uh, the fact that he's now the rector of the Episcopal Church uh, in Muncie. Uh, several notices I want to highlight in the bulletin. Next Saturday, uh, Eagle Scout uh, project sponsored by Gary Stewart of our own Troop 82, a special food drive for Operation Hope. You'll find the details in your bulletin. I want to thank you for your continued uh, generous contributions to the Mercy Learning Center and the need for the mothers and the children at Mercy um, to help them in this time of deep unemployment for them uh, with your uh, gifts of food and the details again are in your bulletin delivered by Thursday and delivered Friday morning. If you're having trouble meeting the rent and uh, many of us are, there is a state sponsored program. Um, please look at the details in your bulletin um, and if you need help in any way, uh, for any reason uh, during COVID-19, remember that the Deacons Fund of First Church is here uh, to help you. And so please give us a call if we can do that for you. Wonderful update on the work of Connect, and you'll hear more about that this morning um, from Rita Skog, an opportunity to communicate your concerns uh, to your legislators and state senator. Um, in the upcoming special session to consider the bill uh, on um, police accountability. Uh, later this morning in our intercessory prayers, you'll be invited uh, to share your prayer concerns. You can add that to the comment uh, section on uh, Facebook and we'll pick them up as best we can and uh, share them in our time of uh, prayer. With all that said, uh, let me take a few moments, uh, let us take a few moments in uh, quiet contemplation during the, the interlude before our responsive call to worship. Let us pray.
Good morning. <clears throat> Please join me in the responsive call to worship as printed in your bulletin. You visit the earth, O oh God, and ask to join the dance. You send forth spring showers, fill the river of God with living water. You paint the wheat fields gold. Creation was made for this. You drench the plowed fields and soak the clods of earth. With rainfall as harrow and rake, you bring her to blossom and fruit. You crown the peaks with the splendor of snow, scatter rose petals down your path. All through the wild meadows, rose petals set the hills to dancing. Let us shout and shout and shout. Let us shout and proclaim the goodness of God, the abundance of God's creation. Let us join our voices in song as we sing for the bounty of the earth as printed in your bulletin and displayed on the screen. Please join me in the prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer as appears in your bulletin. God of all creation, be with us this day. Give us a vision of your presence in the midst of our strife. Give us courage and confidence that you are with us, calling us to be your loving people in the world. It is so easy for us to focus on all the things that are wrong. We spend much time and energy in anger and sorrow, leaving behind the possibilities of hope. Forgive our willingness to get caught up in the negative and direct our steps to produce growth and peace. We pray as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So good morning. I'd like to uh, ask uh, anyone who's interested in the children's message of the children's sermon uh, to join me here um, around the computer or the TV or whatever it is you're looking at. I want to show with you one of my great accomplishments this summer, and it's right here. It's this little tomato. It's the first tomato of my garden season. Uh, right as of today, this tomato, how much do you think this tomato is worth? I mean, it's, I know it's going to be delicious. It's a little underripe, but I decided I had to pick it before the deer ate it because the deer are eating almost all of my plants. The poor deer don't have enough to eat. And so they decided that my garden, Jerry's in my garden is a good place to come. And I hope they enjoy it. This tomato as of today is worth $42.17. That's what I spent on the plants and the fertilizer and the garden equipment and so forth. So I'm sure it's going to be delicious. Now, this little tomato began as a seed. And then the seed sprouted and it grew into a plant and then the plant gave forth this seed. This is what's called 
the miracle of creation. Now I'm gonna take this tomato and I'm going to cut it in half. This is a momentous occasion, cutting the first tomato in half. Oh, look at that inside. Oh, it's so beautiful. Can you see that inside? What do you see inside the tomato? Seeds, right? Each one of these seeds has the potential to be a new tomato plant. Now, in this particular case, it doesn't have that potential because I'm going to eat this when I get home. Jerry will have half and I will have half. But look at all the seeds that are in here. You and I are seeds too. We come from seeds. Through the wonder of God's care for us, uh, we create new people through our seeds and the gifts of our life. And we share the seeds of our life and our love and our commitments in our daily living. Jesus told this wonderful parable about casting seeds. He used a lot of agricultural stories to tell his uh, tales. And one of the things that reminds us is that how we spend our time, where we use our energy, where we give our gifts, how we treat other people are the seeds that we are sowing in our lives. It's not just tomatoes. It's our lives that create something new and wonderful um, for other people. So today and all summer long as we eat the wonderful fruits of the season, corn and beans and squash and radishes, and later in the year, turnips, ooh, and butternut squash, and all of the wonderful gifts. Eat a lot of corn, corn is excellent. And tomatoes are super good this time of the year. Buy a garden tomato or grow a garden tomato and you'll taste a little bit of heaven. So as we uh, cast our seeds, let us share that great love of God in all that we say, the seeds that we sow in our lives, the love that we share with everybody we meet. Thanks be to God, amen. Good morning. We light the candle of witness this morning for Connect. I don't think I'm on you. I'm sorry. Good morning. We light the candle of witness this morning for Connect. Congregations organized for a new Connecticut, a partner through the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport. Connect spearheads action and advocates on important issues affecting our communities, such as immigration reform, gun control, and currently for criminal justice through the legislature during the, uh, through the criminal justice reforms and the police accountability bill, which will be moving through the legislature during the upcoming special session. Our racial pathways group is supporting the police accountability bill and we'll be writing to our state representatives and senator requesting that they support the passage of the bill, LCO number 3471. If you support greater accountability and oversight of policing in Connecticut, we urge you to join, join us in our letter writing campaign. You can find information on the church website or can contact either Lucas Walker or myself. We support Connect because the social justice causes that they support align very well with our social and racial justice concerns and initiatives. Thank you very much, Rita. Our growing relationship with Connect, like that with the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport, a key way in which we reach out to the world. Uh, we are stronger together as we seek to serve the world in God's on God's behalf. We do so so much more effectively uh, when we do it with our brothers and sisters uh, in the wider community. So thank you for taking the lead on building this new and important relationship with Connect. Uh, this morning I want to share with you uh, a story and Jesus' um, explanation of a parable 
that comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew. Uh, last week, the parable of uh, sowing the seeds, some on fertile ground, others on uh, dry ground, the path, and in the midst of the weeds. Um, and today, another parable about sowing seeds. This one's a little different about weeds and how it grows with wheat. Um, right after this parable, Jesus uh, tells another one about the mustard seed, which is the smallest seed, he said, but which when planted grows into a bush that is greater than any bush. And he tells the parable about the uh, woman taking yeast and adding it to uh, flour. And so the flour uh, begins to grow and it grows and expands and becomes bread. So the littlest thing can become the greatest and indeed most nourishing thing. But this morning, let's look at the parable of the uh, farmer who goes out uh, to sow his seeds and what happens. Jesus put forward to them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone, a farmer, who sowed good seeds in a field. Parables are stories that Jesus tells for which the meaning is not always necessarily immediately apparent. What's this all about? Uh, sometimes we think that Jesus taught in parables so that everything would become perfectly clear but as he says it a number of times, no, he tells parables so we won't get it immediately, but we'll have to struggle with the meaning. And perhaps over time, as we search for meetings, we'll discover new understandings, uh, particularly across our lifespan. So the farmer went out to sow and he sowed good seed. The good seed, that's an important part of the parable. But then while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Brambles or uh, dandelions, who knows what else, weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants began to come up and to bear grain, the weeds appeared as well in the field. And so the servants, the workers on the fields, came to the householder and they said, Master, did you not sow good seed? Where then did all these weeds come from? This is a big part of gardening, right? He's taking care of the weeds. Where did these weeds come from? And Jesus answered, mm, or rather the man answered, oh, an enemy must have done this. And they said, well, then, do you want us to go out and to pull up the weeds? And the farmer replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. So let them, both of them, grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay. From here, it goes on to tell the parable of the mustard seed and then the, the parable of the, of the yeast. So before we move on to Jesus' further thoughts on the meaning of this parable, let me uh, share with you a few thoughts on uh, this particular point. One of my professors uh, used to say that Jesus taught in parables that were fit to his time, when uh, people lived uh, paycheck to paycheck, day laborers, those who didn't know where the next meal or the next rent check or the next mortgage payment would be coming. He spoke to people who felt hard pressed financially. He also spoke to people who lived on the land. They were agriculturalists. Uh, they didn't have desk jobs. They didn't work in uh, big corporations or in systems. They weren't uh, scientists working in a lab. They were people who lived right in the land, sometimes many of them literally sleeping under the stars for lack of a home. And he said, we ought to go out, my professor said, we ought to go out and write new parables, parables about 
uh, megabytes, parables about platforms and software and hardware, uh, parables about mapping the human genome systems theory. Well, I don't have any of those because I think the parables of Jesus do really well because we all know a little bit about farming, not much. There aren't many professional farmers among us anymore, a few, um, but we all know what it means to plant a seed and see it grow. Now, one little thing. Do you know where everything in that plant comes from when the seed sprouts out, out of the world, out of the earth, right? And then you water it and fertilize it. It grows, gathers nutrients from the ground. And, um, but all, all that growth, this little sprout that becomes a tall plant, where did all the material, all the matter, all the cells in the plant come from? Did they come out of the ground? No, because there's not a hole in the ground. All those nutrients, all the, all the cells, the fiber, the fruit, all comes from the air. The plant takes all of the elements and the nutrients and the minerals and everything in the air and through the miracle of photosynthesis, transforms it into a plant. Okay, so we have these parables of agriculture. And we can all understand this uh, need uh, to separate the wheat from the chaff or the weeds from the wheat, right? It's a funny parable, isn't it? Because usually the rule of thumb in gardening is to get rid of the weeds as soon as you can so that the good fruit, the wheat or the, the corn or the tomatoes, whatever they are, they can grow without the weeds competing against them for the nutrients, both from the ground and uh, from the air. But this time, the farmer says, no, just let them be and separate them at the end of time. Jesus and his friends and those who followed him in his earliest days thought that they lived in a time when everything was going to come to a crash, a crashing tumultuous end. They felt hard pressed. They saw enemies um, all around them. They were afraid um, of the forces that were arrayed against them. And so it has a Sometimes an extreme view is expressed by Jesus about what will happen to those who aren't uh, following Jesus. Very understandable given the circumstances. So the disciples didn't quite understand the parable. So later on in the gospel, it says in verse 36, and then Jesus left the crowds and went away into a house. And his disciples came to him and they said, uh, explain to us, please, the parable of the weeds of the field. They were confused, didn't seem to make any sense to them. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's how Jesus refers to himself, particularly in Matthew and Mark. The one who sows the seed, the good seed, is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. So he teaches about this as though it's an allegory. This means that. And the enemy who sowed the weeds, the children of the evil one, come from the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with a fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and of evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where they will be with their where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone who hears listen. It's one of Jesus' favorite phrases. If anyone who has ears, let them listen. Let them hear. Anyone whose eyes, let them see. So this is a pretty extreme view. And it implies that uh, the end is right around the corner. But I think there's another way of thinking about this parable, and that's about our own inner lives. I think the seeds that are sown 
by the Son of Man, land in the fields which are our hearts and minds and lives, our souls, our persons, who I am, who you are. And sometimes there are a lot of weeds in the field of my life. And Jesus is saying, you know, we have to take care of those in some kind of way. We have to develop in a different way. Otherwise, the weeds will overtake the fruit of the good seeds, the wheat. And so we need to think about our lives as the field in which we are called to grow and develop in a different way, to set the weeds aside and to let the good wheat grow to fruition. I think a lot of us these days are very discouraged. <clears throat> we feel heavily beset um, by just the normal activities of daily living, um, the losses that we suffer through life and death, the illnesses that always prevail um, and are with us. But more pointedly, I think we also feel a great deal of uh, discomfort and anxiety and maybe even depression over the three afflictions of our particular day. First, the ravages of COVID-19. 138,000 people in America have died and around the world, even more. Many people are suffering and are still suffering and the virus does not seem to be um, abated by our efforts to date. The economic dislocation and the grinding poverty that we said so many Americans, even before COVID-19, has now been expanded. And our whole economy is uh, suffering under the uh, required uh, quarantining and separation and loss of economic activity. So we're very anxious about our money and our welfare and our ability to provide for our families and our security and retirement. Very deeply anxious. And then, of course, the uh, rising understanding within America of the uh, primordial issue of race and racism in our country, the great ravages of a 400-year history of white supremacy, um, and the need to create a truly just and equal society. So it's very easy for us in these days to feel that um, things are so bad they will never be resolved. You may know that the... Um, the Chinese uh, symbol for a crisis uh, is also the symbol for an opportunity. This crisis is an opportunity for our nation um, to deal with some of the deep underlying issues in our lives and our life together and to make things right. The greatest uh, crisis in the early, the first third of the 20th century, of course, was the Great Depression which became an opportunity for America to remake itself into a more just and equitable society uh, through all of the uh, provisions uh, that came out of that crisis. In the same way, the crisis of this time can be a moment in which our national, our body politic, the way we govern and understand ourselves can be transformed and set on a path to provide for justice and equity in fact, not in theory, but in fact, uh, for all people. The great upswelling when uh, three quarters of American people now recognize and affirm in recent polling that race is a central problem in America. Up 25% uh, in just five years. This deep understanding uh, that the need to create a truly equitable society, a truly free and equal society is paramount and is in the interests of all of us. So this moment uh, can be deeply troubling and I understand that and I feel it. But I also think the antidote to that fear and anxiety is a hope for the future. Not an empty minded optimism, but a hope that we will pull together. And when we respond to God's mandate of love and hope, when we see in each other, not enemies, we have to stop seeing each other as enemies. We can disagree, as my grandmother used to say, we can disagree without being disagreeable, right? 
Each one of us is a beloved child of God. We must learn to see that in each of us is the presence and the light of God. This is a new way of growing, not to see enemies, but to see fellow and fella sisters and brothers of God. This is a week in which uh, we're deeply attuned to the remarkable life of John Lewis. One of the greatest leaders in the movement for civil rights for which are of course human rights in the mid to late 20th century and for 30 something years a congressman, member of Congress from Atlanta uh, who survived and suffered terrible beatings and near drownings um, in his life as he stood as a great champion for nonviolence. He was a student of uh, and friend, confidant, and collaborator with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Both of them were uh, devoted uh, students of Gandhi, um, like C.J. Vivian, his other colleague who uh, died this past week, one of the great marshals of uh, nonviolent resistance in America. But John Lewis articulated a hope, even in the midst of all the great suffering of his life. He embodied a trust that in working together, we can make things right. When we see something that's wrong, we have to speak up, not just speak up and speak out, but he said, we must act. And I'd like to share with you an epigraph uh, from John Lewis, which I think is a, a wonderful, um, an epigram, an epigram from uh, John Lewis, um, a wonderful message to us uh, today and always. Lewis said, you are a light. You are the light. Never let anyone, any person or any force dampen, dim, or diminish your light. You are a light. You are the light. Don't let the forces arrayed against us dampen or diminish or dim our light. He then goes on to say, study the path of others as he did with Gandhi. Study the path of others to make your way clear and more abundant. To recognize that we are engaged in a journey in which our forebears have gone before us to show a way of justice and of peace, of equity and of love. John Lewis liked to say that I don't have any enemies. I only have people who I love. And we will act with nonviolence because if we are wrong, we will have hurt no one but ourselves. This is actually C.J. Vivian said, if we hurt anyone without, if we, if, if we practice nonviolence, we will hurt no one in our cause. But if we are right, others will join us in the pursuit of justice. So let's not become overly discouraged and uh, believing that the end is near. But let us believe that in the future as we work together, we may truly accomplish God's will for the world, God's justice and its fruit, which is peace. Justice, then peace. For you are the light of the world. Amen.
In our prayers of uh, the people this morning, in our thoughts and in our minds, we have lots of uh, things to share with you this morning. I um, want to share with you the uh, happy news that Jane Ellingwood, many of you will remember Jane, who was a seminary intern with us several years ago, will be ordained next Sunday on the 26th in a Zoom service. Uh, she has been called to be the interim associate pastor at the church in Ridgefield. We're delighted for Jane and for Christ Church uh, that she will serve so fully and well, and particularly for the people of Ridgefield. I want to express our very sincere sympathy uh, to the family of Nelda Hull. Uh, dear Nelda, one of the great lights of our congregation, one of the true pillars of our church, uh, died on uh, Wednesday this past week, 100 years and 10 days old. She made her 100th birthday, wonderful celebration with her children on that day, um, and then just became weaker and weaker and finally slipped away um, with her family at her bedside. So uh, it's a deep loss uh, for all of us. Nelda was such a wonderful, uh, loving, uh, kind. I, Nelda's one of those people, uh, you don't have to make anything up about Nelda. Everything she did uh, was rooted in kindness. We're gonna miss her, I will miss her uh, greatly. Uh, there will be a uh, private memorial service today at the Spear Miller Funeral Home, uh, where I will um, be with the family. And then uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., you are invited uh, to the committal service uh, for Nelda, which will be held at the Oak Lawn Cemetery. Um, and that will be at 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, public graveside service uh, for Nelda. Also want to express our very sincere sympathy uh, to John Harmon and to Clara in the death of uh, John's sister, Susan, um, following her long uh, battle with uh, pancreatic cancer. And we hold you in our hearts and minds, uh, Clara and John and all your family um, in this very sad time for you, I know. Also want to express our sincere love and sympathy to the many friends of Kathy Silva uh, Kathy was a uh, hairdresser at Hair and uh, had many, many friends, very young woman, tragic, the tragic accident that was on um, 95 the other day, uh, struck by a traffic, uh, by a 18-wheeler, uh, just terrible circumstances. Also have um, some uh, prayers uh, for you uh, coming in on the... Um, on the Facebook, let me look at those for a minute. Uh, Holly Silzicki um, has asked for prayers for uh, teachers and for parents um, as we move through the summer and contemplate what education will look like uh, this fall. And uh, she asked for prayers, understandably, especially for parents who are also teachers. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, unknowns. Uh, there are very few answers at this point. And so for all of the uh, educators who such an important part of our community and for all the children who are learning um, with their parents and their teachers um, we surround you with our love and support and our prayers and let us know how we can help you in any way please also like to uh, ask your prayers uh, for peter robinson's uh, parents um, sally his mom is 91 years old recently returned uh, home uh, from a hospitalization and uh, to the care of her husband paul who is 97 uh, years old. So our prayers are with Sally and with Paul. Now, let me see if there are others here. Adrian Bunnell asked for our prayers for her father-in-law, recently uh, diagnosed uh, with cancer. Oh, Deanie Eckert Medvey said, uh, Deanie, you know, is one of the wonderful members of the flower committee who delivers flowers from our services uh, and takes pictures with them. And it's really neat. Uh, Deanie says, it was always a pleasure to take the altar flowers uh, to Nelda. What a joy. Right? Um, prayers for Marianne Bamford's mother, um, who's had a fall and uh, fractured her back. A continued prayers for uh, Petrina Cash, uh, following her recovery from uh, recent surgery. 
In your bulletin, uh, you'll also see a note from Anthony and Lauren Danisco about their imminent um, departure from Fairfield, moving up to uh, Wallingford um, and to the continuing care retirement uh, community there. Uh, the moving van's coming on the 23rd. Uh, for well over 30 years, nigh on to 40, uh, Anthony and Lauren have been uh, stalwart, stand up, faithful, loving, committed. Uh, I don't know what to say. This fr friends and servants and leaders that just, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to be like around here um, without Anthony and Lauren. We thank you. We love you so much. And know that this is a great move for you and pray that uh, God will be with you. But boy, oh boy, wish you were not going. But you have promised that you'll come back once uh, we're able to be back in the sanctuary together. Um, that day will come. Don't know when, but it will. And when it does, I know you'll come back so you can uh, receive all the hugs and well wishes uh, that you so richly deserve. So thank you, Anthony and Lauren, uh, for a lifetime of friendship. I uh, also want uh, to uh, invite your, uh, your prayers and cards for Ken Dowling, who was 93 yesterday, Helen Barnum, who's going to be 91 on the 25th, and Jean Caldwell, who's going to be 90 on the 6th of August. Uh, so let's shower them with cards. You're so good at this. It means so much to these folks when they get these cards. So uh, they're... Um, their addresses are in your bulletin, so please uh, do send your cards to them. Also want to uh, continue to express our love and uh, care for Heather Hamilton um, in the passing, the death of her, sudden death of her uh, sister Heidi, um, and very, very deep trouble for her. And Maria sends uh, her thoughts of wishing the best for Lauren and Anthony, who will both be missed by me, says uh, Maria and all of First Church. So then uh, let us join our um, hearts and minds in the, in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, source of all life and love and hope. You are the font of our days. You are the blessing of our lives. You are the sustaining presence that makes everything possible. Without you, oh God, literally we are nothing. In all the ways in which we seek to know you love, you are always reaching out to us. In our friends and family, in the difficult circumstances of our life, which always seem so unwelcome, in fact, contain within them your presence and your love for us, reaching out to us always in love to show us that you are fully and consistently present to us for the needs of your beloved world, for the needs of the disciples gathered at First Church, for all those who stand on the front lines of COVID-19 care, and for the scientists, the scientists who will show us a way to come back in a, in a society that is medically sound and is sustainable. For the pastors and deacons and all the members of this church, especially for our young ones and for a deepened resolve on those of us who are a little further along in years to deepen our commitment to leave for them the world which more nearly reflects your prayer and intention for us all. In Christ we pray. 
Amen. Like the farmer in the parable, we are all sowing seeds in our lives. How we spend our money, where we give our time, expend our energy, use our abilities and our gifts are the ways that we sow our seeds. As disciples of Jesus, we have chosen to sow our seeds as, as a congregation by loving each other and all people and by serving the world. You are reaching out to one another in love and helping others. You've been making masks, donating to the Mercy Learning Center, Operation Hope, and other organizations, making and sending cards and phone calls to people to let them know we're thinking about them, delivering groceries, welcoming refugees, our new neighbors, and working for racial justice. In all these ways, you have been sowing seeds. You're also continuing to support the church financially. Think of your monetary gifts as seeds in, that grow into the praise of God and service of people in their needs. Your financial gifts are expressions of your commitment to God. There are many ways to send your gift by mail, the church website, or by credit card or bank transfer. All those details are in the bulletin and on our church's website. May all of our gifts, those of prayer, time, talents, and money, be seeds that grow into a bountiful harvest to glorify God. Let us pray. God, you are the font of every blessing, every seed. Gather and bless all the seeds we sow, offerings of love to you. Send down your Holy Spirit on them and on each of us. And through the power of your love, make us to be instruments of your justice and your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you uh, for your generous gifts, the sowing of your, the seeds of your life, by which the uh, harvest of God is increased and enhanced and enlarged for all of God's people. Uh, two other um, Thoughts were shared after the prayer, or I saw it after the prayer. One was uh, from Michelle Velez asking uh, for prayers for her uh, mom's husband. And also uh, greetings from Lauren and Anthony saying, good luck. Uh, oh, from First Church says, good luck, Anthony and Lauren, we will miss you. That's from the official church website. <laughs> Great. So we have been together as best we can, joined by the Holy Spirit as the body of Christ. Remember, no matter where you are or where you go, no matter what you do or who you claim to be, you are a member of the body of Christ. You are the hands, the feet, the heart. You are the words that Jesus will speak. You are the actions that Jesus will undertake. The love of Jesus will be known to people because they met you because they were touched and served and helped and loved by you. Don't forget that. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the abiding presence of God's Holy Spirit, that sweet communion of God's love that holds us together wherever we are, be with you now and always. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. By good counsel, guide uphold you with the shepherd's care and fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Amen.
Go in peace, peace and love and serve the Lord and all God's people. Amen.